Hello, my name is Lance Wilbur. And I'm Dwayne Lemon. And we'd like to welcome you to TKS, A True Knowledge of Self, where we get to know ourselves from a biblical perspective. Mm -hmm. Now, Dwayne, uh, you understand that uh, as we go through this program, we're going to be dealing with some controversial subjects. We're going to deal with uh, some subjects that people might not be exposed to. It might be new for them. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be kind of be uh, using as a backdrop uh, this conflict. Mm -hmm. And in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, it talks about a war. And we're needing to help everyone understand that we're engaged in this war. There's a conflict, a controversy. Right. Now, it talks about a war that started in heaven, but it also goes on to say in verse 12 that this war came to the earth. Mm -hmm. And we have to understand that the war or the battle is over the minds of humanity. Mm -hmm. Something also interesting in verse 11, it talks about how humanity overcame or gained a victory in this warfare. And it talks about the overcoming of humanity by the blood of the Lamb, which we're going to talk about extensively in future episodes, and by the word of their testimony. And this, in fact, is what we're going to be talking about in today's episode. Yeah. We're going to be talking about the power of one's testimony to overcome obstacles. That's right. To have the power, obtain the power to save. And not only for us as individuals, our own stories, our own testimonies, but the power to transform others' lives. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be dealing with your testimony today. And mm -hmm. I'm going to start by asking a very simple question. Mm -hmm. Where are you from? Well, I'm from New York, uh, specifically Hollis, Queens, to be exact. And, uh, you know, coming from New York and the East Coast, there's a lot of things uh, pertaining to urban life that you find are several types of origins in New York. One of them, of course, is, is one of the things that we're going to be addressing a lot in our episodes, which is the hip hop and R&B culture. Um, I was heavily exposed to that, you know, from a childhood growing up. And I'm the youngest of eight, grew up in a home uh, that had both mom and dad, you know, and I was very privileged to have that. But at the same time, even though mom and dad were there, uh, I found myself at times, you know, receiving love from my mother as best as she knew how to love, receiving it from my father as best as he knew how to do it. Um, my siblings, I have four brothers, three sisters, and even though we all had our own lives, we tried our best to connect together as a family unit. But I think just, you know, being an individual, growing up, urban lifestyle, there was no religion of any kind. So there was not uh, Christianity, Islam, or Judaism, or any of the connecting dots that are, you know, bringing us back to these major religions. But nevertheless, we were a household that tried to do good to the best of what we understood to be good, and uh, we thought in our minds that we were a pretty well-to-do middle-class family. Yeah, now let me help uh, the audience understand what we're dealing with. When we're talking about hip-hop culture and we're talking about New York City, New York City is the birthplace of this culture that now spreads across the globe. Mm -hmm. And Hollis, Queens is one of the flashpoints yeah. for the hip-hop movement. And so understand that this family, your uh, upbringing, mm -hmm. is in the middle of this culture that is screaming forward that some people think is a fad, but is actually taking uh, New York by storm and soon to be taking the world by storm. That's right, because you know when you think about New York, especially when you're looking at uh, the 1980s going into the 1990s, which is of course my era, you know you're talking about some of the greatest hits to ever hit the hip hop and R&B industry. Mm -hmm. Everybody from, of course, Run DMC. I said um, Hollis okay. Queens, so you know that's where Run DMC were from. Yep. And then all the way down to LL Cool J, uh, you know, Q-Tip and Fife from the Tribe Called Quest. I mean, all of these different, you know, major rap groups, major hits uh, today, uh, this is where they got their origin, right there in, you know, Queens, New York, or somewhere adjacent to it. So you're right, it, we were right there entrenched in all of this. So tell me a little bit more about how now your childhood and your upbringing and your mm -hmm. household kind of formed you or shaped you as a man and, and the things that you ran into growing up? Yeah, I mean, you know, everybody, you know, the Bible lets us know that we all have purpose. You know, we were brought into this world for a reason. We are not the results of some bang or some freak accident that just took place. Mm -hmm. We have purpose in life. Now, when I look at the book of Isaiah 43 and verse 7, it tells us that when God made us, he made us for his glory. I didn't know that, of course, because, again, there's no religious background. But 
I had the hunger and the passion from a child to find out, well, what is my purpose? So I looked around. When I looked at uh, my father, he was a jazz musicianist. Um, he was a drummer specifically and very, very talented at what he did. My mother was a corporate woman. My brothers, for the most part, were musicians as well. My brother Leslie, he played several instruments. My brother Vernon, mm. instruments. My brother Michael, you know, um, I know that he liked to sing a lot. And I guess being around that musical upbringing, plus I grew up in a household where we were very musical. We listened to music all the time. Yeah. We listened to a lot of rhythm and blues. We listened to a music style that was called funk. And, um, you know, there were a lot of guys like, you know, the P-Funk Parliament movement with, you know, Clinton and, and um, some of these other guys, but, you know, their names elude me right now. But the point is, when I was around all of this music, obviously it started to mold me, as you asked. Right. And I'm trying to figure out, well, what's my contribution? Because I can't play the drums, I can't play the bass, I can't play anything, and I can't sing. Yep. So it was at a young age that I discovered whenever music would come on, I would just start dancing. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I mean, I would just start dancing, my legs would just start moving involuntarily. And it was at a very young age that I started to develop a skill set for dancing and I got real good at it at a very, very early age. Right, so explain as well that uh, there's different elements to the culture. We're not gonna simply just be talking about the music and the partying, mm -hmm. uh, because there's all different dimensions of the influence of hip hop, but specifically you get now involved in the dancing aspect or the mm -hmm. breaking aspect, and this is one of the, at least probably it's the earliest recognized uh, exposure mm -hmm. and aspect of hip-hop that kind of went out to the world the break dancing and the dancing culture it's extremely large oh yeah and it's everywhere yep. so talk about your experience as you started getting into that in the street level yeah I mean cuz again my mother and father because they didn't have major heavy guidelines to, to, to guide me in growing up I was heavily exposed to the street I was exposed to street life so even though I didn't live street life quote-unquote I was exposed to it because I was surrounded by different friends. Oh, you were around you know, it. Yeah, I was just around it all the yeah. time. So <laughs> as a result of that, I found myself meeting some brothers. Um, they were into the break dancing. We started to form a break dancing group, and we would walk around with our little cardboard boxes, and then we'd just tear them open, pour a little talcum powder on it, and everybody started doing everything from back spins to head spins mm -hmm. and you know all this stuff. Right. There was a difference between the break dancer and the one who did pop. And yeah. I was the guy who did pop, which is usually when they use their arms and all these yeah, different don't things. don't do it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, right. you know, and <laughs> these were the guys who did more of the pop, and that's what I did. So yeah. I found myself more so the guy always standing and doing the upper movements than the yeah. guys who were down on the floor doing all the dirty, grimy spinning and everything yeah. else. So I found that this was intriguing me. This was pulling at me, and dancing became an outlet for me because I didn't think I was a good-looking guy. I didn't think I had anything that could really draw people to me to make me feel the kind of special guy that I wanted to feel, mm -hmm. uh, girlfriends, things of that nature. But dancing became an outlet for me to get attention. And as a result of that, I found that dancing became this medium for me to get glory. Yeah. Again, I didn't understand this whole Bible principle about us giving God glory. Yeah. So everything was about giving myself glory. So dancing became the outlet for me to do that. So I got into the break dancing mm -hmm. and then eventually, you know, just growing up and eventually getting to high school level we started to transition in more different forms of dance which was still connected to the hip hop culture. Right. And I started to bring that talent and those skills and those abilities into the high school arena. Right, so you're going to parties, you're getting recognition. Yep. Uh, and now there's a flashpoint, or you, at least at the local level, you start to blow up. Yep. So what happens? Yeah, I mean, so can you imagine, one minute you're walking down the street and people actually initiate saying hello to you. Mm -hmm. uh, one minute, the young ladies that you used to look at are far off and wish yeah, that yeah. they would give you some attention. Now all of a sudden, you're getting attention. Mm -hmm. So I became kind of the, the, the local, real, real local neighborhood celebrity. But when I went to high school, I found myself in another realm where mm -hmm. once again, I'm not known. Once again, I don't have a lot of friends. And now I have to try to find a way to you know, grab and get people to befriend me. To establish yourself. Yeah, just yeah. to kind of establish myself, make a name for myself. So I knew, again, I didn't have anything about me from dress or looks or any other type of talents or skills to draw people to me, but I knew I could dance. So I found out that in high school, they had something called Homecoming King, Homecoming Queen pageant. Mm -hmm. And that was basically a talent show. And everybody got a chance to go on there and demonstrate whatever their talent was. In my case, it was dancing. So. I got a chance to perform, and when I began to dance, lo and behold, um, you'll probably see the picture come up on the screen here where you can see now that I became the homecoming king. 
Uh, next to me is a young lady by the name of Melinda. She was the homecoming queen. She was a wonderful singer, but for myself, it was the dancing. And, and at that point, I'm not going to lie to you, I felt like I was on cloud 999. So you I got the like glory. You have the glory now. I got the glory now. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's, it's interesting looking in hindsight because when I began to study the Bible, and I began to read about the characteristics of the being that was known as Lucifer, who, who eventually became Satan, is when you read Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 14, the Bible shows that his whole motif was about bringing glory to himself. Mm -hmm. He was not satisfied with the gifts, the talents, and the skills, and the abilities of which he had plenty of with God. He wanted God's position. Right. And therefore, he said, I want the glory that belongs to you. And that's why the Bible says, I will be lifted up. I will ascend above the stars. All this I talk. And I found myself in my I stage at that point in high school. Now, as the story goes in scripture and as the story goes for many of us, uh, there's a crisis moment. Yeah. There's something that happens as you continue to build yourself up, you build yourself up, things are going well and something intervenes. You know, there's some humbling experience. So yeah. uh, what happens with you that makes that transition or that crisis moment where you had to think differently? Well. One of the things that happened was when I was in school, um, again, I feel like my high school became my congregation. Yep. So now when I go there as the minister to that congregation, the minister of dancing, you know, I expected to get praise. I expected to get glory. Well, there were some visitors who came by the school and when they came down to the school, they were also dancers. And as they started to dance at a talent show, the whole auditorium was responding to them to the point that we even lifting up their hands, yeah. you know, which we know is an act of worship. Um, I'm sure they didn't know that, and I didn't know it either at that time, but nevertheless, it is what it is. Here it is that I'm watching these brothers dance on stage, and I'm watching how the auditorium is just giving them all this praise and everything, and jealousy rises up yeah, in my Yeah, you feel heart. disrespected. That's right. And, yeah. you know, and when a brother feels disrespected, he wants to handle it. Yeah. So that's what I did. So I got a few friends of ours, and we went up on the stage, and we started to make a move around the stage where we were walking around the guys in a circle, kind of like how a shark circles yeah. around his prey. Yeah. But to dancers, that was communication that I'm about to battle you. Yeah, battle. Not fight, but battle. Challenge. But the problem was is that the teachers and other people didn't understand that body language. So they thought we came up to fight. So they told us, get off the stage. I got off the stage. And uh, long story short, before you know it, somebody thought I wanted to fight those guys. I didn't. And they started a fight with those guys, started to beat them up. And the whole auditorium, it would seem, went to get my back to start beating those guys up. And a major fight broke out. People got hurt real bad. Police cars, ambulances, everything is showing up at my high school now. And uh, when I came back just a few minutes later, because I left, took a little walk, came back, saw all the police cars and the ambulances. And then when I came inside, people said, what are you doing here? I said, what do you mean, what am I doing here? I'm, I just want to see what happened. They said, you need to get out of here. You, they saying you started this fight. Mm. And I was like, well, I didn't start anything. And the long story short of it is they were convinced I started the fight. The guys who were dancing were part of a vicious gang that was known in Brooklyn, New York, called the Decepticons from the cartoon The Transformers. Yeah, we, we heard about them in Massachusetts. Oh, OK. That's, See? that's how that was. Yeah. yeah, there you go. So, I mean, they were part of the Decepticons. And that, that, anybody who knew about that gang knew that they were no joke. They were not the kind of people you wanted to mess with. So I found myself going home that night. And when I got home, my mother called, my mother opens the door. She has a phone in her hand, tears in her eyes. And she's saying, why are these boys calling me, telling me they're going to kill my son? These guys called Decepticons. And I was like, are you serious? And, you know, mom said yes. And long story short, that crisis moment, yeah. I had to drop out of high school because my mother said and my father, we're not going to let you go back to school because if you do, these guys will kill you. So as a result of that, it was through death threats that I could no longer go back to school anywhere in Queens. And my mother and father said, you're not going that, you're just going to have to figure out something else. Right. So that was that crisis moment that kind of kicked in. So that kind of escalates. Mm -hmm. Does it die down? What, what's the end result of the conflict? Uh, the end result is I had some good friends who knew that I didn't start the fight. Yeah. So what they did was they got in touch with some of the guys on the other side, told them Dwayne didn't do it. And they pointed out the guy who did it and the guy who did it or got, you know, started the whole fight, they did end up killing him. Hmm. So the, again, these guys meant business. They were gonna do what they said they were gonna do. My life was spared now, but when I went to my mother and father and told them, I said, okay, so everything's okay, can I go back to school? 
They said, no, we don't want you to go back to school still. You're just going to go ahead and need to find a job. Hmm. So now I'm on the hunt trying to find a job. I have absolutely no skills, talents, or degrees or certificates. How, of, how old are you at this time? At this time, I'm 16 years hmm. old. No, 16 going on 17. Yeah. So I'm like, what am I supposed to do now? And then this is when um, I found myself trying to get odd jobs, working at UPS in different places. Hated it. I mean, I, I, I understand. Yeah, I mean, I, wasn't, I hated it for several reasons. So I knew that I needed to make money. My parents knew I needed to make money. But the problem is I didn't have any skill sets to do it except one, and that was the dancing. So here I am. I'm always sitting down watching music videos. I'm mm. watching people perform. I'm watching people do all these things. The thought started coming in my mind, why can't I be on the video? Right. Why can't I be one of those guys? So therefore, I started to hear about auditions. For the first time, heard about auditions. How would you hear about them? Well, when you go to house parties, yeah. a house party is always going to lead to a club. Because you go to a house party, you meet people, especially if you meet dancers. If you meet the dancers, the dancers are going to tell you, hey, have you ever heard of the Palladium? Have you ever heard of this place, that place? So I started finding out about all these clubs throughout Queens, New York, some in uh, Brooklyn, most in Manhattan. And therefore, I started to go to the clubs in Manhattan. In the clubs in Manhattan, sometimes you had celebrities come by. Right. What, what people don't realize also is that as hip hop is growing in popularity and making money for major companies and major labels, they're actually sending workers, scouts, A and R's, yep. talent scouts are going now into the clubs all the time. So even locally in the boroughs, but mainly Manhattan. All and the if you time. got if you got to that level in Manhattan, showcased there somehow. Yep. Then it, it attracted the attention definitely. Exactly. So before you know it. In going to the clubs, you meet people, especially when you meet the other dancers. Yeah. And there's always a battle. Now, if you win the battle, then that, that's huge. Mm. That's huge. You see, what happened was I knew that I needed to get with a dance group, so I didn't want to kind of do everything myself. So at this stage where I started to transition from uh, high school, now going into the club scene, I didn't go by myself. I had kind of a group with me, and there were three brothers that I was part of a, a, a dance group with. We were called Quiet Storm, mm -hmm. and the words Quiet Storm meant we walk soft, but we hit hard, and That's that was the whole concept, the Quiet Storm, you yeah. know, walk soft, but hit hard, and uh, I actually have a photo of them, you know, of some of the brothers that we worked with, and, you know, these are some of the guys that I work with. The one on the fence, his name is uh, Lonnie. His, his stage name was Shadow. And uh, it was because, you know, no matter what anybody could do on the dance floor, he could shadow it and do it better than them. So that was his concept. Because, you know, stage names was huge right, right. in hip hop culture, and it still is. So he was shadow. Uh, the other brother with the dread standing in the front, that was Excel. The other brother, the light skinned guy standing in the back, that was my good friend Damien, but, you know, his name was Dagger. Yeah. And then my name was Dez. And, you know, <laughs> that sounds real corny, and, but it did have a meaning. Yeah, and yeah. the word Dez. It was D-E-S. It stood for dark, because that's obvious. Yeah. Then there was ecclesiastical, yeah. which was interesting, because yeah. even before I gave my heart to the Lord, I did feel I was a spiritual brother. Yeah. You know, so I just accepted spirituality in its general sense. So ecclesiastical, and then the S was skillful. So that was Des, dark, <clears throat> ecclesiastical, and skillful. So now we are all partners. We're going into the club scene. We're dancing and performing and doing all these things. And then eventually we started to meet people who said, hey, have you ever heard about an audition? Mm -hmm. I was like, what's that? They said, well, this is where you can go and meet some of these artists and you can perform. And if they like you enough, they will put you in their music video and they will also pay you and this, that and the other. And I was like, man, can you imagine getting paid to dance? Because yeah. you know, I'm dancing for free. Just exactly. In my opinion, I'm just loving life. But now to get paid for it, now it, there's a business aspect to this. That was blowing me away. Right. So before you know it, I started to go on some auditions. Uh -huh. And so how, how long did it take? How many did you go to? You know, you know, what was the climate like? And, and when did you get a break? Well, there, there are uh, several scores and scores of auditions that you typically are going to go to because the best talent in New York City is going to come to those auditions, yeah. especially if it's a big artist. So if it was like a local rapper or something like that, then, you know, you, you probably won't have a large turnout. The competition's easier. But when it came to the big names, especially in those days, you know, we're talking early 1990s, you know, early 1990s, late 1980s, early 1990s, mm. you, you got some really big names now. You got the LL Cool J. That was a huge name in hip-hop. You had yeah. Run DMC, of course. Yeah. Huge name in hip-hop. Queen Latifah, huge name in hip-hop. Yeah. So if you had anybody like that, that's where you, you could literally go up against up to 500 to 1,000 dancers 
and then you got to be scaled down to be number one pick. Right, so they're casting for videos, they're casting for tours. Exactly, right. videos and tours. So I went on several of them, and there were several I did not get. The one that was probably the greatest breakthrough for me was uh, Queen Latifah. Okay. Queen Latifah ended up holding an audition, and uh, she wanted to bring some people with her on what was called the Public Enemy Apocalypse World Tour. Yeah. And it was led, ma obviously. Massive tour. Massive tour. It yeah. was Public Enemy, Leaders of the New School, which included Busta Rhyme, um, Tribe Called Quest, Queen Latifah, several hip-hop artists, major yeah. hip-hop, Naughty by Nature. So when I went to that audition, um, I performed, and I was dancing before Latifah. Latifah was sitting just a few feet further from where you're sitting. She was sitting back there, and she had to watch me dance. And I was right in front of her, and I just put on my best. And when I performed, she looked at me, and she kind of had this smile on her face like mm -hmm. she approved. So I was really happy. So I went home, and my phone rang. And when my phone rang, there was this woman's voice saying, hi, could I speak to Des? And I was like, OK, not everybody calls me with Des. So right, right. You know, scaling it down, eventually I said, who's this speaking? This is Queen Latifah. Yeah. And I was like, oh, OK. And you know, got a little excited. I, I, I had to, you, know, <laughs> you, you got to try yeah, to keep yeah, cool. But yeah. nevertheless, got excited. And then from that, she said, congratulations, you have been chosen to go on the tour with us. Hmm. So it was from that point that I was able to really transition where now I'm not the guy sitting down watching the videos, but now I'm the guy that was in the videos. All right, so you get the break. You go on, are you going on tour? Is this a video? This, was, this specific one was this for the public, tour. The Apocalypse tour. Yeah. So you go on tour now, and this obviously is going to lead to other jobs, oh, other yeah. spots, other slots. So to what extent did you, you know, blow up, as they say? Okay, well, I got a chance to work with several artists. Uh, some of them were really, really known in the time when I was performing. Some of them are not as known today, and then there's some artists who are. The artists that I don't know how prevalent they are today yeah. in, in the hip hop and R&B industry, but there was a gentleman by the name of Tony Terry. Yeah. Uh, he, was, he was a great singer, great singer, very talented, and I worked with him. There was a, when house music was a big hit, today yeah. you don't hear a lot about house music, but when house music was a big hit, one of the big names behind it was CeCe Peniston, okay. so I got a chance to work with her. Um, there was also a lady by the name of Lisa Lisa, Hispanic sister, yeah, yeah. and uh, Lisa Lisa and the cult the jam, cult that's jam. what they were called. I remember. Yeah, <laughs> and you know, so these were the folks that I don't know if they're as known today, but nah, nevertheless, not. they were pivotal yeah. at that time. And yeah. you, again, late 1980s, early 1990s. So other artists that are known today? The artists that are known are more so like Queen Latifah, obviously. Okay. Uh, Naughty by Nature. Yeah. Then there was uh, Wu-Tang Clan, which of course has Method Man there, which a lot of people still um, acknowledge in, in the hip-hop realm. Then there was, of course, uh, what's the other one here? Brandy. Okay. Brandy was a major breakthrough. I got yeah. a chance to go on tour with Brandy, Keith Sweat, uh, Boys to Men, uh, the group, the R&B group called Silk. Brandy is still a major hit today. Mm -hmm. So I didn't just perform for them and go on tours with them and do the videos with mm -hmm. them. But then it got to a point that it moved me even to a higher level, which took me to more the business aspect of dancing, which was choreography. Yes. I never knew this. I, could, I was very creative in, 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 in putting together dance steps. That was something that I, I knew how to do. So it was consistent that every time I would perform, people would say, hey, can you make up some of the steps? One day, I was asked by a group to go ahead and create about 12 routines. When I said, OK, what will you pay me? Mm -hmm. And when I discovered the amount of thousands of dollars that you could get paid just for creating one song, that's when I started to realize, wow, there's a business aspect to this whole thing. Because, right. you know, again, I'm the kind of guy I was happy just to dance. Right. So it didn't make sense to do the dancing per se, but now go to that next level yeah. and choreograph and make crazy money. Exactly. So now here it is. I'm now in the, the hip hop and R&B industry. I'm entrenched in it. Now I'm in the videos. Now I'm going on tour. Now the limousines are dropping me home at night. Now all of these things are happening. I'm making thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. And as far as I'm concerned, I have arrived. That little void that was in my heart from way back, mm -hmm. even as a child growing up, of just a point of satisfaction that only God can fill, mm -hmm. it was still there. And it was amazing that you could make money it was amazing that you could be in the limelight. It was amazing that you could have people wanting your autograph and all this other stuff, but still there's an emptiness inside. There are people who often think, how could a multimillionaire actor or actress or somebody kill themselves? Mm -hmm. What in the world are they sad about? But they don't understand. You can make lots of money. You can be in the limelight. You can have people watching over you and loving you, quote unquote, 
But at the end of the day, there's a void in every man's heart that is designed only for God to fill. Right. And it was because I didn't know that, that going through the industry. Now, here's, what's, here's where it gets deep. Yeah. When you do not have that void filled, you try to fill it. With the stuff. Exactly. You try to fill it with stuff. And this is why it is very typical in entertainment that there's always somebody buying the latest car. There's mm -hmm. always somebody getting that unique iPhone that only they have. There's, oh, there's got to be something unique. There's got to be something different. There's got to be something special and extravagant that stands out that can bring about this temporal satisfaction mm -hmm. that only God can fill in truth with eternal satisfaction. Right. And now, I mean... We're going to have to transition because in our next episode, we're going to go through that journey yep. of how that transition, what sparked it, why make the change, why even consider a change, considering the fact that you're at at least somewhere in the top of your craft, of mm -hmm. your skill set. And that's the thing. Like you said, as we get into an area where we find success, there's still the social needs that aren't met mm -hmm. by money. Or you might try to seek it through relationships. Or like you said, you might seek it through things, material items. And there's that spiritual side as well. And this is what we're going to be focusing on and talking about mm -hmm. with true knowledge itself. Hip-hop is rampant with spirituality. There's a religious undertone that kind of guides and governs the, at least the thought process uh, and the thought leaders of hip-hop. And so it's out there. So we're going to talk about you know, some of those transitions, some mm -hmm. of those interactions and the different uh, encounters you had with those various religions and what kind of led you to consider something greater than yourself and move into what we now know to be the truth. So I want to encourage the audience uh, to continue to uh, tune in, to invite a friend and consider when we talk about true knowledge yourself, we're talking about hip hop culture, uh, does it really have it? Or is there more to the story? Is there truth? In scripture is there a way to escape without having to sell drugs without having to having to uh, become an athlete without having to go into the music industry or the entertainment industry is there another way to escape the trappings of the city so we thank you for tuning in to TKS true knowledge yourself and we want you to continually remember as it says in the Bible in Proverbs chapter 2 and verse 6 the Lord gives wisdom and out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Remember these things and we hope to see you again.